Okay, I'm going to begin again. Uh, I'm still looks like I'm having some technical issues. Um, hopefully, some the the students that were on will join me back here in a second. Uh, I believe I had to reboot, but I believe I've got something going. Okay, so um, let's let me go ahead and um, um, say again. So I did get back a problem set to uh, example solution. I, I returned back evaluations for people on that. Um, I wanted to just talk maybe uh, briefly. Um, uh, five minutes or so about the, uh, the the problem set questions, uh, a little bit more about the second one. But on the first one, um, I guess it was relatively fine. I, I guess uh, most people, although a lot of people really could use, I mean, try and be better, you know, try, try and uh, if you're proposing a solution to make it clear what it is you're proposing. Okay, so, so a common idea um, to fix this first problem is that um, um, you might put, you might apply like a fixed penalty to the priority level for ready suspended processes like like you might reduce their priority by two uh if it's if it's currently suspended out okay and then and then you would pick the process with the highest priority that's ready uh even if it's ready suspended but after applying a penalty that reduces you know thing that's suspended okay another thing i probably should have mentioned this i mean a lot of people do seem to be unclear what suspending and unsuspending a process means okay so you know everybody should understand the basic five states that that are our, our um, textbook talks calls the five state process um, diagram so that that's that's really kind of the ready running and block those main three plus two extra states so a state for uh, new processes that are entering um, and being traded and, and a, a state for a process that's finished or done. Okay, that that's the basic thing that we're implementing in our second assignment here is, is those five sort of mainstays. Okay, but operating systems can um, uh, do this thing to processes that we call suspending the process or swapping it out. Okay. Um, what that means is that um, and oh, and, and if I can pause here, is my um, audio Sound okay again here? All right, yeah, sorry about that. It looks like I'm still gonna be having technical difficulties here. I basically restarted, um, but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm back to kind of where I was talking on problem set two here. So um, if, if you're not clear of what suspending or swapping a process out is, uh, you ought to go back and review that um, on uh, chapter three here before our second test. We'll review it before test two here. So uh, suspending or swapping out a process um, is done whenever the operating system, uh, whenever memory is kind of overloaded. So, so memory is, is one of the primary resources that's needed for programs to run efficiently and well in an operating system. And if it becomes too loaded, so there's more demand for memory than you actually have memory on the system, um, modern operating systems will uh, do what's called suspend a process or swap it out, okay? What that means is the, the process is completely removed from memory, okay? So the, the process is still entered in the process control block, but any memory that was allocated for it, for its code and its data to actually run gets deallocated so it could be used by other processes. So that's what suspending a process means, right? So, so that frees up memory so that other things can run. But that's why it's, it's, it's expensive to um, select a process that's suspended to become the next running process because you can't just simply give it control of the CPU. You first have to load it back into memory, which means you first have to reallocate memory and then load its code and data uh, into that allocated memory before you can start running it right so that that's the core of the problem and, and you know i think some people are, are still kind of fuzzy what it means to suspend and unsuspend the process so anyway so think about that um and i did want to mention something uh, discuss a little bit about the second question for the problem set here um Oh, and, and if I can, I kind of want to try to, sh to show this. Uh, so uh, th this question is important to understand uh, for our next unit. This, this is setting up setting us up for when we talk about concurrency um, and issues in concurrency, okay? So most people, but maybe not everybody, 
weren't quite understanding the interference or, or the, the basic problem that's occurring here, okay? So I described this in the example solution. So what happens here, one, one reason why it happens reliably in this code is there is a difference in how the thread function increments my global versus how the main function, the other thread increments. So the, the main function reads out my global, adds one and, and writes it back in immediately before sleeping but the thread function reads out the value of my global into a temporary variable, increments it, but then doesn't update it till after sleeping, okay? So here's typically what happens. Let's say my global is currently has a value of five, and let's say the, the thread function is running. So at that point, um, it would read out five into J and increment J by one. So now J would have six, but then it would sleep. So remember, my global is still five, but J has a value of six here. Right. It hasn't updated the increment yet. So uh, if we sleep and remember another thing I, I talked about on Tuesday uh, or on Monday um, is sleep is basically a mechanism for causing a process to become blocked. So this process will be this thread will become blocked, which could very well allow the operating system to select the other thread to start running. OK, so if the other thread starts running, it would execute this code where it would read out the value of my global, which remember is still five add one to it and write it out. So now my glow, it would successfully write it out. My global would have a value of six. Um, um, and then it would also get blocked, okay? And then we could very well then switch back and start running this process. But remember, when we switch back, when we unblock this thread, um, um, the only thing it has left to do uh, for its attempt to increment my global is to write J back out there. But, you know, my global has six from the, um, the read, add, and write back um, from the main loop, but J also has six. So we end up just writing six again over my global. The, the effect is that we, we lose one of the increments because of the delay between reading the value and writing the result of our work back out there. Okay? So that's fundamentally what's happening here, all right? So you will find and, and yeah, I, I, I actually kind of want to run this, um, spend a few more minutes on this. Um, so you will find, let's see if I still got my problem set two container. Let's start that one running. Um, so the, the kind of proposed solution that I was expecting was that um, you do something like, um, um, change, uh, I mean, at, at least just, just move the, the update, uh, to before the sleep. Okay. To make it, make the, the, the second thread more like the first thread. Okay. You'll find if you do that, that that does have usually the, the desired effect, um, because we give less of a chance for the the um, program to, you know, to be interrupted um, and the operating system to switch over to the other thread while we're doing the update, if we do it like that, right? So if we change that and rebuild it so that our uh, thread function is doing the update before uh, it blocks itself um, and then we run it. Um, you'll see, even though we get, you know, different interleavings and stuff. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, although it is still possible that um, you don't get 50, you're, you're much more likely to get 50. But so, so what I was working up to, so there was an ex one example of that there is that um, um, it is possible to be uh, still that the operating system uh, forces like times out the um, um, this thread in between reading the value in, incrementing it, and writing it out. So if we, it, again, if we get interrupted in here, not because of a voluntary block, but involuntarily, like like we this thread just gets timed out, you can still get a, a non-50 result, okay? So you might say, okay, well, I mean, can we make this uh, um, like an, a, an atomic instruction, right? So what if we were to just directly increment my global and, and I could even change that in both places, right? And we'll rebuild it.
So if, if you do that, so I got lucky there, but if you do that, maybe or maybe not surprising to you, I mean, again, you're still likely to see 50, but not always, okay? Um, and, you know, the, the thing about that is that uh, it's actually not the case that this is, is an atomic operation, okay? What, in a high level language like this, what this actually probably gets compiled down to is at least three machine instructions, three machine um, op codes, right? So normally what you have to do is you have to have a load instruction to load the value from memory of my global into like a register. Um, and then there would be like an add one to do the increment on that register. And then there would be a store to store the value of the register back out to whatever the uh, memory address that was assigned to hold this my global global variable here right so so even though this looks atomic in a high level language it's not there, there's there's usually at least three machine instructions being x that this gets compiled down to um so the fundamental problem remains even if you're not doing any sleep at all um that um um this code is inherently unsafe although this this makes it much more unlikely if you make um if you, if you modify both the threads so that they're doing their updates uh, before, not 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 while they voluntarily sleep, okay? That that I mean that that's kind of a big issue here. That the way this was originally in the thread function, since it waited so long, since since it actually didn't perform finish up its work till after it returned from being voluntarily blocked, um, it's much more likely that the other thread would run um, and uh, do some work while it's in between trying to do its work, while, while, while it started doing its work but hadn't finished it up, if that makes sense, all right? Um, so yeah, if we completely remove the, the voluntary sleep, um, um, I think that that makes it even harder to to see examples of timeout, and then what you'll what you'll normally see is one process completely runs all the threads since it's not voluntarily blocking. Uh, one 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 process completely runs all of its um, iterations of the loop. Uh, one one thread does, and then we switch over and do the other thread, right? So here, um, but I mean, they still might interleave, but but if they interleave and they don't interleave in between the uh, three instructions to update, um, you'll still get fifty. So anyway, th this makes it pretty hard um, to actually get a non-50 results here. Um, but um, if you were to like increase this to a lot larger, you'll, you'd be much more likely. So, so like if we had both loops execute for 100,000, we'd expect a result of 200,000. And it'll take a little bit longer to run, but um, and I should probably remove the output. But 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 yeah, you'll see it usually happen a couple of times. Um, um, running that many times there. So all right. Anyway, so I just wanted to mention that. So that was kind of um, um, I consider this kind of important understanding what's happening here because th this nicely sets us up for the next unit. But this is kind of um, um, anticipating next week's material. But make sure you kind of understand that if you didn't fully get all that. Okay. Um, all right. Any questions so far? So I wanted to spend most of the remaining time then seeing if we have questions or, or talking more about the second assignment. Um, although one thing I'll mention that um, There were some lecture videos about using standard template library classes that people may or may not have found, um, I think probably under um, uh, I guess it was under the, the week three. Uh, yeah, I did. I did have some video, some videos where I discussed the programming science, maybe a little bit dated, um, and also uh, discussed using uh, standard template library lists to, to act as, as um, stacks and queues. Okay, um, if um, 
if you look in that example um, repository, there is a, um, um, a folder called STL that I, I'm going to update here that had that code for that video of the stacking queue examples. Uh, but um, I wanted to I, I wanted to add to that maybe real quickly because uh, I actually added into this assignment for for this class. Uh, we, we use maps, um, which are, um, if you're familiar with other programming languages, th these maps are basically uh, what are called dictionaries or key value pairs or hashes um, in other languages sometimes. Um, I didn't have examples of, of doing kind of maps, but let, let's, let's, let me see if I can real quickly maybe, um, and I'll, I'll maybe I'll push this to the code repository if it might help any help people. Um, but uh, let me add a new example. Let's, let's just talk five or 10 minutes about uh, this map, these map data types. So um, So if we want to use a map, um, like queues or lists or whatever, we have to include map. I believe that's the standard template library header file that has the map uh, data structure defined. Um, Let me just get this so it's building here. I need to add it into our make file. Um, so map executable depends on the map object file here. All right, let's see if that builds and runs. Um, uh, there we go. So we're building the map. Uh, let's see if it runs. All right, so let's let's just show some quick examples of using the the map um, um, uh, you know dictionary data structure here. So uh, I've shown this before. You know, I recommend um, C plus plus dot com for. Um, um, uh, standard template library documentation uh, it's usually the first one that comes up if you kind of search for STL, some data type in STL. Um, so map is uh, another name for this is an associative container. Okay, so, you know, um, most of those examples in the other uh, lecture videos kind of came from examples from this documentation. So, for example, if we want to construct a map, um, we can look at um, the um, Um, uh, the, the examples of, of constructors here, but so, so they're relatively easy. So basically what you do is um, you say you want to have a map and you have to give two, two things in the, the template, the, the, what the type is of the keys and what the type is of the values. Okay. Um, so, you know, um, um, so if we wanted to map from um, ints to strings, we could create a map called uh, uh, name map. All right. So that would construct a map that that um, lets you enter in key value pairs um, uh, into the map. Okay. Now you know regular arrays in C++ are really 
maps. They're just mapping integers to um, um, integer values to um, um, a, a you know a, a type, whatever the the array type holds, right? Um, so you can do that with the map. Like like since I'm mapping integers to strings, um, you can use a map pretty much in the same way. So if I wanted to use this to map, say, uh, let's say the integers represent um, social security numbers. So um, like maybe my so or my my ID number, whatever it is, is one, two, three, four. I can map that to um, a string in this case, since the, the mapping goes from keys to values, right? Um, so, you know, you can use, I saw some people were using the um, insert, um, um, member function. So you can use the insert member function in the same way. Um, so yeah, some people were, were trying to, I guess we're doing it from the example here. Um, sometimes these examples aren't the clearest. Um, So, so you know, th this is basically, you know, if you've got a map from characters to int, uh, we're inserting a, a pair, the map from the character to the int. I thought that you could actually, though, use insert uh, in a simpler way. Um, let's try it out here. So I was looking to see if um, it showed that there. I might be wrong here. Um, so, you know, the, the way it, it's showing here, I mean, should work if you wanted to use the insert function. Um, So um, I, I probably should have shown, you know, um, um, to show that this is actually working here. Um, so you know, here we were sharing a value, and then we can you can retrieve it out. The, the nice thing about using the um, the indexing operator um, is you can use it both to insert and also to read a value back out. So. Um, like that, so it should work. Um, oops, had a syntax error there, so. Um, So here we're uh, creating a map between ints and strings. Uh, you should only have to include the, um, I, went, I went, went ahead a little bit too fast there. So you should only have to include the map container to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm using that using namespace STD. So I shouldn't have to do the STD con con in front. Um, Um, although, let's see here, did I, did I forget and include? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so. Um, so yeah, definitely I'll see here. I'm missing something. I'm not certain why we're, we're having some compile problems here. Um, So when in doubt, let's back up here. So this did work. Get the standard output here. Uh, I must have a stray character in here somewhere. I don't know what I did. Um, All right, just give me a second. Let me, let me just restart that there. Um, let's try that again. Somehow I introduced a bad character in there. Um, All right. Um, yeah, I'm not completely certain what I did there, but um, let's see. Let's try that again. So if we include the map, I always get to do incremental development. So if we include the header file, still build. Oh. Okay, well, I'm going to have to move on. Yeah, I'm, I'm not certain what's going on there. Um, I'll get that fixed and figured out. Um, so I'm just going to have to talk through some examples here, unfortunately. Um, huh.
All right. Well, yeah, I don't know what's going on there. Um, we'll have to just skip over that. Every time I try to include map, now I'm getting that. Uh, maybe if I restart my container, I might redo anything. Um, let's um, um, let's just show some examples here. So, and I'll have to try and compile this and run it later. So, um, um, if you have a map. You should be able to create a map like I showed uh, between any two different types, like from an int to a string. You can use the insert. I was going to try to test that. Um, I thought you could use insert to do something like, you know, if it's an int to a string, you can give it an int and a string. Like that. Although you might have to use the um, uh, you might have to actually pass it a pair uh, like was in shown in the insert. Um, I'm not certain if that's required or not. So the map um, insert here, their, their examples are usually shown where you have to create uh, one of these pair objects. So insert takes a single um, A single pair object to insert a, a key value pair in there. So, but yeah, the, the the pair object that you create should be of the same type as your map. So, like a character and int. So, in our case, um, um, assuming you have to do it this way, we'd have to um, give it a. Uh, so, so, yeah, if this doesn't work, where you can just pass in two parameters, which it might not for insert. Um, You might have to instead create like a pair of the, the same type of pair as your map. So an int string in this example, um, and then pass it in the two parameters of your um, integer and your string. So, um, you know, one of those should work. Um, but um, as I started saying before, if I find the uh, indexing operator easier. So indexing operator can be used for assignment. So that will actually create an association between a key and a value. So if I want to set one, two, three, four to be the string, there's a harder, you can do that. Um, and then you can, you can insert other things like that. So for our um, second assignment, we have a map between um, something like this, between process identifiers and uh, processes. Right, where, where, where a process identifier is just a typed up, a name for an integer. So process identifiers are really integer 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, and process, though, is, is a actual uh, process object. Um, um, uh, an instance of a process object here. So, um, which we can get by including the header file for that. All right, so, you know, um, if you have that, you know, it can work in the same way. So, you know, um, if, I, if I create a new process, um, where processes, you know, so here's, we have, you have to use the header file to know how to, to actually use a process. So a process has two constructors, one creates kind of like a, a, a default process, but the, the other constructor is the one you normally need. This creates a process that starts off with a particular process identifier and a particular and, and the, um, the the time when the process was created in the simulation. So um, so that would be the one that we would normally use, like in our new process. Um, um, our, our new event function, which was like the second task that you have to do for the assignment. Um, where you would pass in, you know, so if I'm trying to create process with the process ID of five, I'd, I'd pass in the process identifier as the first parameter for the constructor um, and the current system time, which is a member variable of our um, um, 
in our assignment two, the system time is a is a member variable, but here I'll define it. So if it turned out that we were creating a, a new pro a new process number five um, at time 20 in the simulation, you'd need to pass in both of those to create the new process. Um, but then you can get that into the process control block. by associating that process identifier with the new process that we just created here, right? So that would actually enter in um, the new process into the process control block um, keyed on its process identifier, right? Um, and then, you know, likewise, so this is an example of um, inserting a new process into the process control block. And if we need to do something with that process, we would need to uh, um, um, access that process uh, to do things with it. So, you know, again, I find it, you know, what you could use the find method uh, of the map to do that, um, where it returns back this iterator, which is a little bit complicated way to use it, but, but you could, do it that way. Um, I don't know if there's an easier way, um, but um, the easiest again is probably just using the indexing operator. So um, so if I needed to make process 10 ready and I had the process ID in a variable called some PID, I could read the process back out of the table like that. So that would give me um, access, that, that would give me a reference to that process basically associated with the process identifier 10. I'm assuming that's there. Um, you can invoke any of the methods for the process. Again, you know, so the common things you have to do for this class is, is make the process ready, dispatch the process, and so on. So, so for most all of the events for the simulation, there's a corresponding event uh, that the process needs to be called in order to do, plus a few other things like, like one, um, to test whether the process uh, time slice quantum has been exceeded yet or not currently. Um, one, to see if the process is waiting on some particular event ID. I don't know if you might need to use that one, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, anyway, so those are the basic things of using the map. Um, uh, and besides that, you know, besides uh, getting that, getting a new process into the map or getting a, a, a reference to a process out of the map so you can uh, do something with that process, change its state, um, you would also, in some cases, need to query the, the process control block map itself for information. So the, 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 the most straightforward example of this is that you, the, the number of processes in the process control block tells you the, the number of active processes currently in the system, right? So, um, you know, so let's get the number of active processes in the sim simulation. we would ask the process control block itself directly. So notice we're not using, the, when you do the indexing operator, it pulls out the value associated with the key that you give. But, but if you just ask the process control block itself, um, you can send it member functions as well, like insert and find, but one of them is the size. Um, so the, the size of the process control block, um, simply returns back the number of key value pairs, you know. So basically that would be the number of processes that we've inserted into our um, system currently, right? Um, so that's the number of active processes would be the process control blocks size basically. Um, and uh, there is maybe one more thing I'll, I'll I'll mention here, um, and then I'll kind of jump to the assignment or maybe open it up for questions. 
Uh, but um, at the end, one of the, the last tasks, when a process is finished, you really do need to get that process out of the process control block so that, you know, for example, that the number of active processes then is correct, right? So um, remove it, removing items, um, again, there's no real um, um, straightforward. Uh, what, what you would normally need to do to remove an item is um, Um, use the what the erase, uh, but erase doesn't take like um, um, a, a particular um, key. It takes an iterator. So you first have to use find to get an iterator and then erase it. Um, um, that would actually remove the key value pair from there, right? Um, but I mean, you know, so but but yeah, a two step sequence like that works, or you can even just combine that into one, I believe. So. Um, so if I wanted to remove process uh, 15 from the process control block, um, I could just erase whatever fine tells me. like that, right? So, so calling fine would return the iterator that erase needs to, to remove that, assuming that process process identifier 15 is in the, uh, the process control block, uh, key value pair mapping. So, um, oh, um, yeah, there is one more other thing. So when you're doing the block and the unblock, um, so we, we also use a process, con a, a map for the, um, the, the blocked list where we, we map an event ID to a process ID. So uh, that map is supposed to be keeping track of, of which process um, is blocked waiting on a particular event. All right, so you know, so this works kind of the same way. I mean, you can use the indexing operator. So if if we're told that that the and, and the process ID is going to be, um, you know, we're going to call the block um, event when a process is running, um, and we're going to told what event is is happening that the running process um, is going to be blocking on. So. So the CPU member variable is supposed to hold the um, um, the the identifier of the current running process. Um, so when you need to block a process, you could do something like this. So, so given the event ID that the process is blocking on. And the, the process that's currently running, uh, its identifier is kept in the CPU. You can give them, you can make a mapping between the vet identifier um, and the process identifier of the process running on the CPU, like that. So, so that would actually enter in a new um, value into our block list, which is essentially saying that you know this process with whatever that's the process identifier is now block is, is is blocked waiting on that event, right? Um, and then you can later on look that up. So when that event occurs to unblock the process, you can look it up in the table on the event idea ID to get the process identifier of the process that just um, So we can do the reverse to look the uh, process identifier back up uh, for the event. Um, for the process that's waiting on that particular event identifier, right? And then once you have that process identifier, you could look it up in the the the, the table again, whatever you need to do with it, like. Right? So given that process identifier, you can look it back up in the process control uh, block, to the PCB and, you know, whatever, unblock it, or whatever you need to do with it. 
Uh, but then again, yeah, when you uh, when you unblock a process, you have to do a similar thing. You have to erase it from the blocked list. So, so after you unblock a process like that, you would have to erase it in that same way that we erased it, removed it um, from the um, um, block list in this case. So you need to remove that event ID from the block list because um, there's no longer a process waiting on that uh, particular event there. So. Um, All right, so that's a lot of hints, and, and like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this working here, and I'll post this um, um, after the fact in case anybody wants to see the code. Although, yeah, I didn't do a lot of code here, so you can probably recreate this on your own. Although, I have to see, I'm not, I'm, I'm still not certain why what happened, but maybe if I just restart my container, it'll clear up whatever problem it was having here with building this. So. So, um, 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 but yeah, so uh, any kind of questions on that? I'm gonna switch over to the assignments. If there's any other stuff I wanna maybe talk about or um, for my student that's here, if, if you did have a particular thing you wanna discuss, let me know. So um, let me just you know say one more one or two more things, and then uh, maybe we'll go through the um, um, assignment description again. Oh, and there were, I, I wanted to discuss just a little bit the system test at the end as well. Um, so uh, kind of back to the actual assignment. So, so again, kind of looking at the process simulator, um, things we were just talking about were you know these two maps in here that you need to use. Um, so when you're creating new processes, getting those in there, um, or um, when you're working on the blocking and the unblocking, you need to use the, the block list. Um, so, um, all right. Um, so, yeah, um, um, why don't we, why don't I uh, uh, finish up here and then stick around and we'll uh, look at that specifically. So um, there's a question about a failing task on three, uh, task three here. So um, yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of um, wrap this up. Um, uh, the um, um, uh, I will just say a final thing about um, at the end, there is some an extra a little a slight extra credit opportunity. Um, so I should show this more. I mean, the whole purpose of these simulations for this class is to actually build a command line tool to run the simulation. So once you get like all of your eight tasks working for this assignment, you won't actually be able to, to pass the, the system test. But once you have these all working, um, uh, you need to um, actually uh, uncomment some things and run simulation, then you should be able to run actual simulations yourself from the command line using the command line tool, okay? So um, at the end, uh, assuming you have all the first eight tasks working, um, there was some stuff in the run simulation method um, in the process simulator.cpp um, that's commented out. So, so these are calls. So, so the, the, this is the main method that, that just executes as a loop continuously reading in events from one of the input files and you know doing the simulation basically all right but but all the, the methods that you implemented like dispatch uh new event cpu event um, are commented out because you know we didn't have implementations of those until you do them in the the task one through eight so if you uncomment all those um you should be able to run simulations and don't forget the timeout um, after the big case statement, so that there's a there's a dispatch before, and then we have a case statement for each of the the basic kind of events: new um, CPU block, unblock, done, uh, and then we time out the end. So so we first check if the CPU is idle and try and dispatch a new process to the CPU. Then we handle the event in the simulation, um, and then uh, after that we check if the if the current running process has exceeded its 
time slice quantum? And if so, we time it out by calling your timeout function here. So um, I haven't actually implemented those in my, my student assignment here, but if you implement those and uncomment those, then you should be able to do this. You have to, oops, comment those back out though. So when you do a build, um, yeah, my, my current state is not building because I've got um, some things not implemented, new event. Um, So I'm going to back off, kind of get rid of these uh, tests here. All right, assuming it's building um, um, kind of as a final thing, you should be able to um, run simulation. So since I don't have everything completed yet, these won't work. But, but one of the things that's created as part of the build process is another executable. So the test has all the unit testing that you mostly work with for the task. The, the sim is the, the actual thing that we're trying to build um, for all these assignments for the class, all right? So this, this is built as a command line tool. So if you run sim, um, um, it's just expecting some command line parameters, right? Uh, and if you're curious, you can see uh, the, the, um, the main function for the sim is in the assignment to sim.cpp, right? So basically what main does is it checks that you give exactly three command line arguments, right? So it's expecting three where the name of the program is the first command line argument, but it's expected two more, right? So if you don't give exactly the, the command line arguments expected, it prints this usage message, right? But yeah, so to run these, basically all you have to give is um, the first command line argument should be um, the, the time slice quantum that we're gonna use. So we typically use like five as our time slice system time slice um, maximum before we time out processes. And then the second parameter is the name of the input file um, that you want to run the simulation on. So those are all in the sim file subdirectory, like um, like process event 01.sim, one of those. So you have to give a path to a full path to the file name or a relative path. So relative to the current directory, uh, all these files are in the sim file subdirectory. So if I wanted to run it on the process events one dot sim input, I could do something like that. So that would actually run the simulation. And, you know, and, and you know, assuming that you completed the eight tasks, uh, it would actually run, except one final thing is um, um, uh, besides uncommenting those things and run simulation, you also do have to implement a little bit of output um, in order to get the unit tests to pass. Um, so this is described uh, in the assignment, but um, um, if you look in the, um, the process simulator down at the very bottom, I believe there's the, the two string function. This is the thing that's actually being called to output the current state of the system. But what you need to do is uh, where, um, it has the CPU, you need to display what the current process is that's running on the CPU, right? Um, and for the ready, for, for the ready queue uh, here, uh, you need to add some code to display all the items on the ready queue. Likewise, you need to add some, some code to display all the items on the blocked list here, right? So if you add those in there, um, that's what the results are. So, so adding in that code for the CPU would display should say idle if, if the CPU is currently idle, or it should um, print out the, the information about the process that's running on the CPU, right? Um, you know, and if you have things on the ready queue, it should display all the things on the ready queue from, from the head to the tail. So the order matters uh, on the ready queue here. Um, and um, same for the block list. So if anything's currently blocked, you should see all the block processes 
uh, out here in your output in the block list, right? All right, um, yeah, so that, that was mainly the stuff I wanted to say. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hang around um, um, uh, the, the student that was asking the question here, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop this um, um, uh, recording for now and go ahead and post it. Um, and if you have questions, go ahead and email them. Uh, but otherwise, I will see you guys later then.